This weekend, golfers and sports fans from across the country are carefully watching the Masters Golf Tournament. And just the other day, I met one of our parishioners who was making his way to Augusta to, to see the tournament in, in person. And he began to speak to me about his own golf game. And he goes somewhat in a humorous way, he said, you know, Bishop, I am convinced that it is the devil who invented golf. <laughs> and I said, well, why do you say that? And he said, well, think about it. The game can bring the worst out of you. You can get so frustrated that you really want to give up on yourself and even give up on the game. So I'm just going to, to watch the Masters. Now you and I know that the evil one, the devil, is at work. But we certainly believe that his targets are not golfers. <laughs> his targets are all of us. Those of us who sincerely want to be witnesses of Easter joy, who want to bring our faith to others, who want to echo the words of John the visionary in our second reading today and proclaim that Jesus Christ sits at the throne. He is the Lamb who was slain and rose. And to him be blessings and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So how will the devil try to, to stop us from being such authentic witnesses of the risen Lord of Easter joy? I hesitate to say this, but I think there are three ways he tries to do this. <laughs> and the first way is just exactly as that man said to me. He tries to frustrate us. I think the devil tries to get us to see our weaknesses, our failures, our sins, to see the, the many times that we have not been faithful to God and all that we have promised in the hope of seeing such weakness that we literally just give up, give up on ourselves. In the midst of such temptations, all we have to do is look at today's gospel. To look at Simon Peter. Three times he denied the Lord. And three times the Lord gave him the opportunity to renew his love and to profess his faith. And that's what Jesus does for all of us. As Pope Francis recently reminded us, God never tires of forgiving. And we must not tire of asking. That is why I am so pleased to learn that so many of you today approach the sacrament of penance to celebrate in a profound way God's infinite love and mercy. Because every time those gifts come into our lives, no matter what our weaknesses and sins, we pick ourselves up. We begin anew. And we say to others, nothing is going to keep down authentic believers of the risen Lord. Another way I believe that the evil one will tempt us and to stop trying to be such witnesses is by helping us to become overwhelmed. Let us take a look at all the evil in the world, all the things that we see wrong in, in the church, in our own families, in society. 
and to see the gravity of, of all those issues. And then in the midst of seeing all that, saying, so what can I do? What difference will it really make? And again, all we have to do is look to the gospel. There are the disciples, fishing, trying their best, but nothing really happening. And then the Lord comes along and tells them to cast out into the deep. And they do as he says. And then they witness a miraculous catch. The Lord doesn't ask us to eradicate on our own all the evil of the world. But each day of our lives, the Lord does ask us to cast out into the deep. The Lord says to us, just give me what you have. Give me your effort. Give me your dedication. Give me your sacrifices. Give me your crosses. Give me your work. And then trust that I will use them to touch hearts in ways you can never imagine and to accomplish in and through you miraculous deeds. In a final way, I think the devil will go after those of us who want to be witnesses of the risen Lord is to point us to the crowd. Look at the crowd. Look at what the majority of the people think. Look what public opinion polls say. And look at how out of touch you are. See, no one else is doing this. The gospel is relative. You can compromise it. You can ignore it. And then in the midst of such temptations, we echo those words, those powerful words, of Peter in that first reading today. Oh no. As followers of Christ, we obey God, not men. Because in doing so, we know freedom and peace. I thank all of you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, for the many ways that you offer such witness. The many times that you make it clear that you follow God and obey God and not men. You do so every time you stand up for the unborn and for the sacredness of all human life in a society that is embracing a culture of death. You do so every time in the midst of a society trying to alter the true definition of marriage, that you teach what marriage is according to God's divine plan. Permanent union, one man and woman, open to life. You do so every time you stand up for religious freedom, freedom of conscience in a society, really, that is trying to limit and maybe even end those precious gifts that have been ours since the founding of our great nation. And I know it's not easy for you. It's not easy for you to do this in the midst of your peers and co-workers in the midst of society. I know you get brushed aside. Some people dismiss you, or label you, maybe even outright reject you. But we say the same thing the apostles said today. What an honor it is to suffer for the holy name of Jesus and to let them know we'll never give up on ourselves. We'll never compromise the truth. And we will always obey God and not men. This year's Ignited by Truth conference occurs as we continue in the Universal Church the celebration of the year of faith. 
And so you come here today to be nourished by word and sacrament and to grow in your knowledge of faith. How blessed you've been with such incredible speakers who have come to us, and we are so grateful to all of them. How grateful we are that so many people were available to give us really good and solid resources to bring home so that we can grow in that knowledge of faith and share it with others. But we all know that what Pope Benedict said when he opened the year of faith is true. That the most effective way we will bring our faith to others is by allowing them to see the joy, the joy that is ours in our encounter with the risen Lord and in following his gospel of life. Letting them see that joy. And when you do, dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you are true witnesses. And by your very lives, you proclaim that Jesus Christ is the true Lamb, the one who suffered and died and rose for each one of us. And to him, blessing, honor, glory, and might forever and ever. Amen.